Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, General Kaler and General Alexander, for joining us today uh, and for your service to our country. And both of those things are deeply appreciated. Uh, General Kaler, um, in, in June of 2010, as the Senate was con uh, was considering the, uh, the, the the New START Treaty, uh, your predecessor, General Chilton, testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, that force level under that treaty, meaning uh, 1,550 warheads on 700 delivery vehicles was, quote, exactly what is needed today to provide the deterrent, close quote. Uh, did I understand your, your answer to Senator Fisher's question as being inconsistent with that? I, as I, I think I did. I, I, I thought I heard you say we could go lower than that. And, and if that's what exactly what we needed, uh, in 2010, what has changed between now and then? Senator, I think uh, I'm not inconsistent with that, so let me explain. Uh, the way we determine the size of the force is we don't start with a number. What we start with is a set of national security objectives. Those objectives eventually wind up being military tasks. Those tasks require a certain number of weapons to achieve. When General Chilton was asked that question, he took a look at the, the national objectives that he had at the time, the task that he was asked to perform, and he looked at the number of weapons that were going to be permissible under the New START Treaty, and he said all of those match. Okay. Okay. My, my point is that we may have opportunities to go below that, but it doesn't start with a number. It's got to start with national objectives and military tasks that would be associated with it. Okay, so you're not you're not saying as of right now you're you're certain or you're confident we could go below that. You're saying it is possible based on further assessments at some point in I, the future. I, yes, sir. I think that's right. I think it's possible based upon assessments, based upon uh, national objectives, based upon the the um, military tasks we would be asked to achieve, and I think it it depends on the nature of any threat that's out there. So I think many factors go into the number. My contention is, though, like the Nuclear Posture Review said, I, I support this. I think we should explore uh, whether further reductions are possible. But one of the reasons why I think I was a little bit surprised to hear you say that, though, is that, you know, in, in light of the ambitious ongoing modernization programs that we have going on um, in, in Russia and in China, uh, and in light of uh, the fact that we've got other countries like North Korea and Iran with aggressive nuclear ambitions, I would think that our, our risk and our threat would be on the increase and our, our, our need for those weapons would not necessarily be diminishing. Am I mistaken in that regard? I think all of those factors need to be considered. Primarily, though, yet today, the arsenal that we have that was built during the Cold War and the arsenal uh, that the Russians have represent the vast majority of the weapons that, that exist. And so... Sure, I, I, I understand that. But, you know, there are a lot of countries that rely, a lot of countries in addition to the United States that rely on our nuclear arsenal. Most definitely. And, um, you know, so that, that umbrella, if you will... It extends over a number of our allies, um, uh, some of which lie in, in close proximity to countries like Iran and countries like North Korea. Um, what consequence do you think it might have um, if, we, if we diminish our nuclear forces even further, uh, either through reductions or because of a failure uh, to, to modernize adequately? Uh, what what impact might that have on some of our allies who rely on our, our own nuclear capabilities to protect them? And, and couldn't that bring about additional nuclear proliferation? I think that's always a possibility. I think we would have to be mindful of that as we go forward, and that needs to be one of the factors considered. Um, now, do you think that um, countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey or maybe other nations in the Middle East might feel compelled to develop nuclear weapons in the, in the relatively near-term future if, for example, nuclear, uh, Iran is able to uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, status as a nuclear power? There have been some reports that some of those countries would consider it. Uh, whether I don't have a, a good feeling from my position about what, what our 
official view is of that, but I think that, again, any time that we're talking about extending our nuclear guarantee, which is what we have done for many, 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 many years, um, that our allies and what they've told us when they come and visit my headquarters is that it concerns them uh, as we consider making changes. So I think we need to be mindful of those concerns and address them accordingly. Right, right. And that probably means that we ought to be you know, cautious before reducing our nuclear arsenal, and we also ought to be very concerned about uh, our, our failure to modernize adequately uh, those same weapon systems, wouldn't it? Because, it, uh, again, I, I, it seems to me logical that especially as we've got um, uh, states like Iran and North Korea moving in that direction, that that, that inevitably will have a huge impact on what other countries do, and what other countries do will in turn most likely put more of a burden on our, um, uh, on us, and uh, f uh, further strain our ability to provide that assurance that we provided in the past. Would it not? I think, Senator, as we have always thought, ultimately our ability to deter, our ability to extend that deterrence and assure our allies with that is based on the credibility of our nuclear deterrent and our nuclear deterrent force. And increasingly, certainly over the last decade now, uh, the, the presence and capability of our conventional capabilities has, has made a difference. And I think in some cases has set a different context for the way we view our nuclear forces, but they still remain critical, I believe, and complementary. Okay. In the, in the minute or a half or so that I have left, I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about China. What can you tell me about uh, the Chinese nuclear arsenal, and in particular, um, whether you believe that um, China will continue to increase its, uh, the, the, the number of weapons in its arsenal, uh, and, and whether it's tr going to try to seek a, a level of equivalency with the United States and Russia in terms of nuclear weapons? Senator, I think the we need to have a more full conversation in a different setting than this. Okay. But, but just in this setting, uh, what I would say is we, we, have, we watch China continuing to modernize portions of their nuclear force. Uh, in terms of numbers, um, I, I, I believe the number ranges that our intelligence community has assessed with that. I, I don't think I can state that here, but, but I tend to believe that, that they're in about the range that, that we are talking about. I do not see, nor has the intelligence community reported to me, that they are seeking to have some kind of numeric parity uh, with the United States or with Russia. But I would, I would quickly say, I think we, this is why we want more transparency with China. We'd like to know what their intentions are going forward, and we'd like to be able to uh, expand our dialogue with them so that we can prevent any misunderstandings. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time's expired.